Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining this interesting and informative webinar. As I say it, come to the welcome to the new norm with whatever is going on around the country and around the world. Probably we will be doing more and more webinars and this is the new way we will be educating each other. So with that remark, uh, I thank um, ATS for giving us opportunity to do, do this. I have been a part of Fellows Track Symposium for many years and I have enjoyed it every year and I have learned quite a lot and I'm sure that will again happen today. It is my pride and my pleasure to introduce, it just gives me goosebumps to introduce our next speaker for this webinar, uh, Dr. Shumita Khatri. Uh, she is um, from the Cleveland Clinic where I have been for a few years. Um, and let me tell you a brief story. Uh, Shumita was my resident and she was my fellow. And it is my great pride now that she's not only my partner, but she's my teacher and she's gonna be my boss as well. So uh, it, it, it's so much pride I have to introduce you to her. And she's gonna talk about a very hot topic of immunotherapy for bronchial asthma. And all of you I'm sure are curious about the new information. Not only that she is my favorite asthma doctor, but she is also President Obama's favorite asthma doctors as she has visited him on a few occasions. Um, and her presentation is going to give you quite a few questions and answers which you may see in your board examination. So hang in there and listen to her and it will be quite informative. Shumita, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. Oh, thank you very much. And um, well, I don't ever know what to do after you introduce me. Each time it just gets bigger and bigger and truly we're all uh, learning from you. And thank you for being such a mentor to probably a person in every country in the world. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank also Liz Guzman for really organizing this and Dr. Shur, as well as Dr. Mehta for inviting me to share my experiences uh, being an asthma physician. And so Liz, if you don't mind, if you could pull up the slides. And meanwhile, I'm happy to see some Lily, hi, Lily. I'm knowing, seeing some people who've gone on and graduated. I'm assuming that some of you already have, or some of you are headed into your senior year of fellowship. Either way, I'm hoping that I can impart to you some of the passion I have around asthma, but morely, more importantly, beating asthma for these patients, because it is such a high morbidity condition in some people, and they suffer so much. And um, I, I'd like to think that we're basically like super sleuths to find out how is it best to manage them. So I will leave um, the tomes of the articles uh, for you to look up as far as reviews on what the different clinical trials are. This is not going to be that kind of talk. This is going to be a talk about what's it like from a practical standpoint to function uh, taking care of patients with severe asthma and being at a severe asthma center. And for those of you who are halfway decent, please feel free to show your face. It would be nice for me to get to know you a little bit. I think that's the part we miss the most. So please feel free, no judgment. Alrighty, everybody. Okay, we're going to get started. And if we could go to the next slide, please, Liz. How I'm hoping to present this to you is to be just some overview of basics of severe asthma and what are the guidelines we have thus far. This is all still an emerging uh, area of work and research, and it is actually the most exciting time to be an asthma physician. Uh, while we have that in mind, we'll go over, go over adverse effects and how to choose which one, and perhaps how to think about switching biologic therapies in patients with severe asthma um, through a case-based approach, okay? All right. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to ask Dr. Mehta, too, if he sees a question that's a burning question. I, I have some time built in for that. Thank you. Next slide, please. So just to get us all on the same page, asthma, as you know, is not just a bronchoconstriction condition. It's a chronic airway inflammation condition, 
where you see chronic changes in the airway walls, including eosinophils, mast cells, lymphocytes. And from that ongoing inflammation, you end up with structural changes. It can be shorter term and treatable, but it can end up being somewhat fixed and more permanent. So that is what we're trying to prevent. So the structural changes that you're able to see on the uh, endobronchial biopsies, you can see at the very bottom, uh, you can see a disrupted respiratory epithelium with goblet cell hyperplasia. The smooth basement membrane muscles are thicker than normal, and you can have increased vascularity. And so often you'll see us talk about doing a bronchoscopy. That's what you're looking for when you're not sure if you have a proper diagnosis. Next slide, please. So as before, all we had uh, was steroids to treat patients. So I've been a pulmonologist nearly 20 years, and I remember I had all the interest in critical care, as I'm sure many of you do. That's probably that hook that got you in, but pulmonary is what keeps you because you know I was uh, very disappointed to see all of the patients had skin fragility and had the buffalo humps with being on chronic oral steroids, and it just did not seem very fascinating at all. But now it is absolutely fascinating because look at how many new therapies we have to allow more personalized care. Now on the right, you see a bronchial thermoplasty figure. This um, presentation will not go into detail about that, uh, but you, can, you know that that has been in the toolbox and we're still trying to figure out where it fits in in the role of biologic therapy, which is much more personalized med medicine. And of course, we do want to collaborate with our uh, allergist colleagues who are also asthma specialists too. Next slide, please. These are all true cases, and the reason I present them be is because I remember them very well. So this is a patient of mine, and he came to see me soon after I arrived at Cleveland Clinic about, oh, 10 years ago, and this is when we had built up the bronchial thermoplasty program. And so they had, that had attracted his attention, and he came from three hours away to figure out if he was a candidate. And he was um, initially then 51 years, 53 years old, and he was in 2011. And he had had a 10-year history of asthma, and he was a non-smoker. Uh, he was very happy that prednisone controls it, but realized its side effects. And his former physician had put him on methotrexate as a potential steroid-sparing therapy. But as you can see, he had some adverse events, uh, effects, the osteoporosis and neuropathy. So basically, when I met him for the first time, I thought we needed just to stop and rule out what other you know, uh, conditions might be occurring to make his asthma worse. So we ruled out ABPA. We optimized his regimen. There had been some advances since he had last seen a, a pulmonologist. And then we did pursue that bronchoscopy, as I mentioned. And why was that helpful? I was just wondering, did he really have asthma at all? Because his lung function wasn't bad, but he was severely severely um, debilitated. So we did the bronchoscopy. It had more lymphocytes than EOs or anything else, and he was on prednisone, but it did show those pathologic changes that I mentioned before. So at that point, there was more excitement and a slightly more ease to get thermoplasty approved. So we, uh, he underwent the three, um, and also I all wanted to see how well he tolerated the bronchoscopy. So you underwent those three treatments and had a bronchial thermoplasty um, course. Next slide. So then he comes back. So he came back mm, like a, a year or so ago. He had worsened again. His symptoms are worse and he never really got off of his prednisone after thermoplasty. But he realized what it was doing to his body and he just weaned himself off and suffered the consequences and the pain. Um, and he continued his ICS lava but he stopped his um, anti-leukotriene. And again, um, he was still at a spirometry of 80% uh, without significant bronchodilator response. So I'm going to ask you, put yourself in my shoes. What would you do next? Next slide, please. There's a polling availability for you. Please go ahead and use that.
Wonderful. Thank you for participating, all of you. Uh, so the somebody, a few people mentioned repeat thermoplasty. Uh, well, there is not quite enough data to support that just yet, so we chose not to do that. Uh, review symptoms, uh, sorry, start a biologic therapy. Yes, a few people suggested that that's certainly a consideration. Chronic oral steroid therapy, I'm glad none of you thought about that because you saw his morbidity. So thank you for being so thoughtful. And then lastly, the winner is review symptoms and reassess. So thank you. Next slide, please. So uh, at this point, uh, I can tell you what we did, which was a combination of all the things that you did as well. So I'm going to get rid of the poll. Uh, so we revisited the diagnosis as we often need to because things can change over time. We evaluated that he had some reflux. We controlled that. His sinus disease needed some optimization. And then while he was off uh, his steroids, we got a CBC with diff. So with that, we found that he was indeed an eosinophilic phenotype, and we started mepolizumab therapy. Um, and then I have to say, like a week or two ago, I had a distance visit with him, and he, you know, he's quarantining, and that's no fun, but he tells me that he feels like I have my life back. So that's extremely, extremely gratifying. So thank you. You, you were all some, none of you picked steroids, thank you, and all of you had some great ideas. So next slide, please. So then let's talk about biologics in severe asthma. I mean, this all goes without saying that you've worked them up and they, you've thought about other comorbid conditions such as reflux, obesity, sleep apnea, tracheobronchomalacia, uh, other mimic mimickers like uh, inducible laryn lyn laryngeal obstruction, ILO, formerly known as PVFM, formerly known as vocal cord dysfunction, um, or bronchiectasis. So for when we've found that there are severe asthma patients, about 30% rely on high dose inhaled steroids and frequently on oral steroids. So we really need to think about how to improve the symptom complex without re increasing morbidity. So biologics have been absolutely a game changer. Next slide, please. I've provided this to you as well as a reference because I find this to be one of my favorite pictures. So you can see on the top, you have the respiratory epithelium, and then you see the different insults that can come and present to the respiratory epithelium, bacteria, viruses, allergens, and they traverse through the um, in interepithelial uh, space and present to the dendritic cells, the DCs right there, the antigen presenting cells. And on the left side of this schematic, you see primarily the Th2 uh, uh, eosinophilic response with the IL-4, IL-25, and the mast cells uh, degranulating and from the IgE production, as well as IL-5, IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5 being an eosinophil trafficker. So that is primarily the section that we'll be talking about. But on the right side, you see that there's a, a, a subset of asthma that is not Th2 rich and more from the Th1 complex. And we have more trouble treating those because we don't have good targeted therapies yet for that. And those are often seen in the non-eosinophilic asthma, the ones that are more steroid resistant. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another wonderful schematic which demonstrate that in eosinophilic um, asthma, that on the left side, you see more of the Th2 um, pathways where IL-13 stimulates Th2 to create IL-5-13 and IL-13, um, uh, IL as I mentioned, via the alarmins at the top, IL-33, 25, and TSLP. So let's talk about TSLP in a little bit, uh, one of the higher level uh, cytokines. On the right side, uh, you have the innate lymphoid cells, which utilize basically IL-13 uh, as well, but is not as eosinophilic, um, is eosinophilic, but not Th2. So on the left side, it's more inhaled steroid sensitive. It's more of the traditional allergic Th2 eosinophilic phenomena. And on the right side, it's more inhaled steroid resistant because it's a late onset eosinophilic airway inflammation. So this is a nice distinction. We need, we have gaps on the right side. Next slide, please. So what makes severe asthma different? You will be able to see based on ATS guidelines what uh, constitutes severe asthma, but really when it boils down to it, 
it's asthma that re requires treatment with high dose inhaled steroids um, and, and a second controller and or systemic steroids to prevent it from becoming uncontrolled or even on that regimen if it remains uncontrolled. And how do you define uncontrolled? Poor symptom control, frequent severe exacerbations, hospitalizations, mechanical ventilation in prior years, and a low, FE, low FEV1 less than 80%. And even though this may be a, a relatively low prevalence of asthma, about 10%, it's the source of highest expenditure. Next slide, please. And we've come a long way. I mean, asthma was asthma was asthma. And then we started characterizing it, childhood asthma, allergic asthma, and you were describing them as various phenotypes, which is fine. I mean, these are descriptive characteristics, uh, such as, you know, what's the airflow limitation? Is it early? Is it late onset? Is it nighttime? But we have now graduated to more of an endotype, where these are subtypes that are based on a certain functional or physiologic mechanism. And what's helpful is if there is a biomarker that is a uh, byproduct of this um, mechanism that you could either track to see whether it gets better and it also tracks uh, improvement. So a classic endotype is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. You've got a disease that's chronic. It's, it's based upon a deficiency of alpha-1 and following um, alpha-1 levels, and if you improve it, can, can uh, be the biomarker of improvement. Next slide, please. We will end up finding sub-endotypes as well. So this is not the end game of endotype, uh, sorry, endotypes. So we've got, as I mentioned, the severe onset, um, or early onset allergic, and that's what we've talked about. This is what we're used to. You diagnose them with spirometry as well as high exhaled NO and IgE, and obviously they do better with steroids or TH2 um, blockers. Late onset is the ones that if you're an adult pulmonologist, um, you'll be seeing sometimes in men more or in middle age, and they'll have chronic sinus disease, and they, they, they wonder, why did I suddenly get asthma? My grandchild has allergies, I get that, but why do I have asthma? And they have the polyps, and they have the um, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, and they are often steroid refractory and dependent on a leukotriene pathway that's dysfunctional. Here also, because it's eosinophilic, anti-IL-5 therapies can be helpful. Other endotypes are the uh, fungal sensitization endotypes, where again, anti-IgE can help reduce sensitization as well as treatment of uh, with antifungals can be helpful. And hopefully that can be managed and people can get better. Um, we've also all seen the more obese, uh, often predominantly female endotype where it's a related to adipokines and it's not at all um, eosinophilic or uh, allergic. And so weight loss in this situation can be helpful. Finally, neutrophilic. We just talked about that in general where um, it can be a fixed airway obstruction. It's not reversible. And what can we do there? Well, these TH2 uh, um, anti-regimens don't end up helping. So we're looking at other ways of anti-inflammatory care. We're hoping that some of the biologics coming down the pike in the future might be helpful for this because that's still our sort of gap. Next slide, please. So just a few brief slides about the biologics um, for eosinophilic asthma thus far. Obviously, omalizumab, we um, talked about that. It was approved in 2003, and it helps to neutralize the uh, IgE receptor by binding to it so that um, it is not active. And uh, it has been shown to reduce exacerbation rate and risk of hospitalization. And the criteria for use is a perennial allergen as well as an IgE level anywhere between 30 and 700. I should say off-label that there are indications even in Europe where higher than 700 is fine and it works well. Um, and it's a recombinant monoclonal antibody that downregulates the Ig receptors and blunts the response. And you can see that schema right there. It's kind of a nice pictorial view of how it works. Next slide. And we talking, we're talking about partnering. One of the most important things as a pulmonologist and in particular an asthma specialist is you have to have a team of consultants with you because you can't do it all yourself. You need to have help, you need to 
phone a friend, you need to investigate other things. And one of the most useful partnerships I've found is with allergy colleagues. And, you know, I think as pulmonologists, we often don't think about what allergen immunotherapy can do for patients. And in fact, thus far, this is the only uh, disease modifying therapy. So what's really nice about omalizumab is when I see a person who has multiple allergies on skin testing or even RAS testing with an IgE that fits that, and they're severe, a kind of severe enough that you're worried about their asthma exacerbations being frequent, especially in the seasons, um, one can use omalizumab to stabilize them enough to be a good candidate to AIT, and it, it works. So um, next slide. <clears throat> I mean, it is time intensive. Let's make no mistake. The sublingual immunotherapy is still not available for much of this, but um, it, with omalizumib pretreatment, you develop some level of stability, and you can go through either cluster immunotherapy or rush immunotherapy to build up a tolerance. So it goes from a sensitization type of immune response to a tolerance type immune response. And it's fascinating how it tricks your body into doing that. I recommend if none of you have read any of this, some of the guidelines on how AIT works is really amazingly satisfying. I really wish maybe in the future, some of the biologics could cause this uh, tolerance as well. Next slide, please. So the second uh, biologic that's been available for severe asthma is mepolizumab. It was approved in 2015. So you can imagine 2003, omalizumab, our first holy grail, but with strict inclusion criteria. <clears throat> then in around 2010, we get bronchial thermoplasty. Okay, that was supposed to be the best thing since sliced bread. We were all excited. We thought the bronx sweets will be um, flooded with these people lining up and getting cured. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, so now we have methylizumab 2015. So like I said, it's very exciting for those of us in this field to be in, in asthma right now. So approved in 2015, the way it's uh, um, delivered is in 100 milligrams sub-Q uh, every four weeks. And now, last year in July, there was uh, FDA approval for self-administration. Up until that time, every few four weeks, uh, a patient would have to come in to an office or an infusion center to have the mepolizumab injection just to ensure there were no side effects. And we'll go over side effects later. But now, I mean, just before this pandemic hit, this uh, became available. So that was, uh, again, another game changer. And how does it work? It basically binds uh, to the IL-5 that's circulating in the bloodstream and impairs that that binding prevents um, attachment to the eosinophils to uh, traffic. So it reduces exacerbation rate by about 50%, another amazing outcome, and it reduces sputum and blood eosinophils. So hopefully that's a biomarker for effectiveness. In addition, it does improve asthma control and it has a glucose um, steroid sparing, glucocorticoid sparing effect. Next slide. So then the third biologic comes along the next year in 26, well, was that, wasn't um, MEPO in the same thing, the same year, um, or very close together, uh, Reslizumab. Uh, this is uh, manufactured by Teva. And so again, similar uh, mechanism where it binds, binds the IL-5 that's circulating in the bloodstream. So very similar to MEPO, different company, and then some different characteristics. Some people would say, why would you need reslizumab when you've got mepolizumab? Actually, they seem to have a little bit of a different areas of strength. First of all, reslizumab is uh, IV. It's the only one that's intravenous. And it is also weight-based. So for people who are perhaps a little heavier, where you wonder if that 100 milligram sub-Q fixed dose of an anti-IL-5 may not be enough, this is where reslizumab comes in. Where does it have its best response? In patients with higher eosinophils and nasal polyps. Um, and so for those who had more than 400 eosinophils per microliter, they had a significant improvement in lung function as well. So you don't often get improvement in lung function, so this is something to bear in mind, that this is something that makes reslizumab special. Um, and it also reduces the frequency of asthma exacerbations. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. So the uh, one, two, three, fourth one is uh, Benralizumab. So uh, this came out in 2017. So you can see they're all racing for the cure. Just keep racing. We haven't found the cure. Uh, that's the, that's the uh, moral of the story. But this was approved in 2017. It has been shown to reduce exacerbations by 51%. And how does it work? If you look at that little schematic, it actually binds to the um, IL-5 receptor on the eosinophils and just blocks it from any of the IL-5 hitting. It's like leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist versus like 5-LO antagonist. Like you, you're reducing the, the sort of perpetuation of that eosinophil uh, response. So by doing this, it actually results in apoptosis of the eosinophils and basophils via antibiotic, antibi antibody depend cytotoxicity. So whereas in reslizumab or mepolizumab and certainly in omalizumab, you don't see depletion, complete depletion of the eosinophils. In benralizumab, you often do. And uh, so that brings up a question, like, is that such a good thing to deplete all eosinophils? We're still figuring that out, but so far, I'll talk about adverse effects again later, we don't see an increase in helminthic or parasitic infections. Next slide, please. So now, uh, dupilumab. It is a little bit of a different mechanism, but really does manage the Th2 eosinophilic asthma side of things. It's an anti-IL-4 receptor alpha, an IL-13 blocker. And I have two little schemas for you. The larger one is a little bit nicer to see that uh, when the dupilumab gray um, antibody is there uh, attaching to the IL-4 receptor alpha, that not just IL-4 is blocked, but also just by way of its bulk, IL-13 is blocked as well. And in the cytoplasm, all of the um, signalers uh, through type 1 and type receptors are therefore not able to proliferate the um, eosinophils and the fibroblasts and the um, uh, macrophages, etc. So the whole cascade is somewhat uh, disrupted at a higher level in, in the sort of inflammatory response. So this was approved in 2017 and now is indicated for moderate to severe asthma and inhibits IL-4 and IL-13 signaling. And the initial indication was for atopic dermatitis. So it did wonders for those patients. And newer indications are in ages greater than 12 uh, with severe eosinophilic asthma and nasal polyposis as well. So chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis has a, has a separate indication via dupilumab. What does it do for asthma? It allows for better control. It does reduce the exacerbation by 50 to 70%, so that's huge. It also does improve lung function. Now remember, pay attention to this, improving lung function 29 to 33%, and is steroid sparing where people are able to totally stop their oral steroids in those studies by about 50%. The dosing is variable, so it can be start with a 600 milligram loading dose, then 300 milligrams every two weeks, or 200 milligrams two weeks sub-Q. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to mention sort of as a caveat that all of these clinical trials, when they're talking about how frequently they're able to be steroid sparing, remember this is a very finely controlled clinical trials where the patients are specifically eosinophilic to that degree. They have the bronchodilator response, every other confounder, is taken care of. So you wonder where they get all these patients because everyone I see has way more than just that, either uh, other comorbidities, et cetera. So know that what we see in clinical trials are guidance, but not necessarily gospel because sometimes we have to use our clinical discretion um, somewhat differently. Next slide, please. So uh, how can these uh, biomarkers, potential biomarkers that are available to us every day, help us predict effic efficacy? And I'll just go back again that these are guide guidances. And yes, the insurance companies basically use that as gospel. But I can tell you that if you can make a good case that it's variable, 
this way or that way that the EOs have been a little lower than that threshold, so give it a chance because the lung function is low. You can appeal most of the time. I think most insurance companies don't want to see their patients keep coming into the hospital, but remember it's a thirty to $40,000 drug per year, and there are patient assistance programs, but sometimes we have to make the case and really what I would recommend is uh, just really watching these patients closely. So I just kind of highlight that these are all lizumab. So like OMA, you want high EOs and high phenols. So some suggestions like high EOs and high nitric oxide levels, someone might do better with OMA lizumab. MEPO, EOs greater than 300 is really what you're trying to see historically or 150 in the last two or three months. Reslizumab, EOs greater than 400, as I mentioned, seem to do better. Benralizumab, any EOs. Why? Because they all disappear. They all explode. Go away. Dupilumab, again, eosinophils greater than 300 just seem to have a more um, significant effect in the clinical trials. Next slide, please. So what do you do? Which one do you choose? I have to guide you into thinking that really pay attention to these patients because every um, company and their representatives will come knocking on your door and try to tell you why theirs is the best one. Make your own decision. And also as you um, uh, prescribe these, pay attention to the differences and distinctions because often patients will say, which one do you want me to take? And I'll say, well, this is my experience, sort of like a panel, like keeping a panel or a registry, what's working, what's not, what's the uh, um, expected time to improvement. So don't just let the companies tell you how to do this. So how does everything fit in? I really like this schema. It was a schema that was available in this uh, review article, but I added some few, um, a few tweaks. So obviously, you need to confirm the diagnosis of asthma, assess the level of control, make sure that it, there's no other reason why it's not controlled. And then if somebody has more IgE high and high to normal EOs, uh, check for allergies and consider omalizumab. If they have high EOs and high or normal IgE, um, then consider these anti-IL-5s and which one, right? So if they're on chronic oral corticosteroids, we, we might weigh them more to the benralizumab and mepolizumab. If they have more nasal polyposis, we might use, um, and reduce lung function, we might use reslizumab. But du dupilumab is good kind of for both because it is of a different mechanism. Then finally, if they're low EOs, we're kind of stuck still. Bronchial thermoplasty has still helped some people, but we're still trying to figure out, aside from macrolide therapy, uh, perhaps some more small molecule therapies coming down the pike. We don't have a whole lot, unfortunately, for that. Next slide, please. So this is our meandering path to hopefully success, question mark, on another patient of mine. So he's 54 years old. He's um, a patient I've seen for a long time, probably about six years. We become friends and he works here. So every time I see him, it's like I get, I mean, pass him in the hallway, I'm looking at his face to see how he's breathing. So, you know, there's a real vested interest to getting him better. So he developed asthma back in 2012. His initial FEV1, the highest one that he had that year was about 78% of predicted. Um, he had thick mucus production, he had variable adherence, though, you know, he was kind of young and robust and he didn't really want to take all these medicines, but he had a lot of atopy with high EOs and chronic sinusitis. Uh, but then when I saw him, his, he was obstructed, his FEV1 was 62% of predicted, and, you know, I knew it was still asthma. It, he had the bronchodilator response, and I did treat his reflux. There was some concern around that. Um, so I was following him, following him, you know, hoping that just tweaking his regimen would work. He hates injections. He hates needles. So even bringing up biologics was sort of like we had to come have some come to Jesus conversations. And so we're closer than ever now. But at follow-up, he remains still at 53% with an ACT score of 12. And those of you who remember, 25 is a perfect score and 20 and above are well controlled. So we added nebulized medications because that's what you do because you don't know whether it's just not getting in there. But next slide. All right, heartburn for me. 
Okay, still not better. Only prednisone's helping. He's having to do this. And then finally, the game changer for me was his lung function kept dipping and dipping and dipping. And he got as low as 40%. And you're wondering, like, I'm just seeing this guy tanking. And, you know, be an asthma doc, you should be able to reverse this. What's going on? So feeling really bad about how he's doing. Next slide, please. So what would you do next? Go for it. Put in your vote. Vote early and often. All right, so um, evaluate for sinus surgery. Yes, absolutely reasonable. He has sinus issues. Um, initiate omalizumab therapy. Yeah, really kind of tie him down and say, look, come to Jesus moment again. Please try this because you are not doing well. Um, CT chest. Yes, uh, perhaps we're missing something. Like what the heck's going on? And then bronchoscopy to evaluate severe asthma. Yes, 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 and yes. Thank you. All of you are right. It's just the order that matters, and it's a discussion with the patient. Uh, next slide. Okay, let me walk you to this, and let me just get to the punchline. We got to 65% two, two weeks ago. Yay, way better than 40%, and he feels good. So how did I do this? How did we do this together? And you'll find different iterations of the same thing. So um, CT chest. It was progressively worse from a prior one. He had had one around 2012. Uh, his diffuse central and peripheral bronchial wall thickening has gotten, had gotten worse. He had uh, diffuse, um, uh, he had mucos, mucoid impaction as well as bronchial opacity. Something was just not getting better. We were not reaching what we needed to reach from an anti-inflammatory standpoint. So yes, we, he did agree to omalizumab. And um, he did have a duration of stability. He stayed adherent, he would come in, but he would, well, he, he hates needles, but he'd come, he'd get to hang out with the nurses and me and uh, he was fine. But a year later, his results weren't that good. Like he was better, but somehow just um, still sort of breath wheezing, using steroids a little too often. Okay, so then allergies wasn't everything, was it? So then we started Benralizumab because I was worried that, um, you know, he has an eosinophil process, Let's see if it's just not getting to where it needs to go. Um, and we started that. Um, but again, all right, I was expecting him to get better. Remember, Reslizumab was supposed to help me, help him get his lung function up, but no. Look, 35 to 40%. Okay, this is where you start losing sleep as an asthma doc. You know, you're like, oh God, oh God, he's coming in. I hope he's okay, I hope he's okay. And he wasn't. So what did we do? We did a bronchoscopy. So another right answer, we did a bronchoscopy. He was on benralizumab, so he didn't have significant eosinophils, but he had PMN, so that made me think, well, does he have a chronic um, indolent infection, chlamydia, mycoplasma, but all that was negative by PCR. Um, his endobronchial biopsies did still support that he has asthma, and he had a lot of smooth muscle um, and a basement membrane thickening. Now, ADPA was hard to prove in him, and he did have a positive colactoman, and, and he was getting worse. So I think we took a bit of a risk. We tried. I worked with an ID doc, and I said, you know, let's make a calculated decision. Maybe he has severe asthma with fungal sensitization, which we don't recognize here, but they recognize in Europe. So we tried um, adding voriconazole, and he did better. I mean, literally, he felt better. He felt like he could breathe deeper, but wouldn't you know it? In six weeks, he gets high LFTs, and it wasn't from wine. It was from his voriconazole. So then what? Finally, we came to the path of dupilumab. And after eight doses of benralizumab, so whatever, about a year's worth, we switched to dupilumab. Because of his, you know, we had multiple reasons to try this. History of nasal polyposis, as well as chronic sinusitis, loss of lung function, eosinophilia. And he's now at 65%. He feels a lot better. Guess what he's doing now? He's like, you know, I'm not sure I need my Dulera so much. Okay, this is not ICS lava. Like, okay, you're killing me. Just take your medicine, please. But 
this is a success story so far. Next, any reason not to have started Dupilumab? Not have started with Dupilumab? It was a journey because <coughs> we didn't have Dupilumab when we started. It just has come out. And so we were actually going up the chain of whichever biologic was next available. Uh, would I have done things differently? Possibly I might have gone to Dupilumab first with a low lung function, not done the, um, yes, um, not, not having um, uh, the low lung function, the resolizumab. Um, but yes, he was very resistant to injection. So every, every step has been a negotiation. Um, thank you, everybody. Good idea. Good, good. So let me see what else is on the chat that I can respond to. Um, okay, good, everybody. Um, thank you for your engagement. This is a lot of fun. I wish I could see you. You know, you still have time to show yourself. Uh, anyway, okay, next slide. So there are other emerging therapies. I think I've had the same slide for the last three years I've given this talk. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for these uh, uh, receptor antagonists. It's not coming out just yet. There was a Fevipiprin, Fevi, that wasn't working. So, you know, fingers crossed, but asthma is tricky. It seems to just find another way to get you. So, but however, there is some promising data, and we're in phase three, trial, phase three trials of an anti-TSLP. It's one of those alarmins that we talked about. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Uh, so you can see here, this is another beautiful slide, uh, courtesy, I believe, of Dr. I can't remember. Oh, it's there. Anyway, um, you can see that there are approved drug targets, IL-4, IL-13, IL-5, but there are emerging um, investigational drug type targets as well. So there's still hope. We're trying to patch together a combination of interventions that allow suppression without developing tolerance. Next slide. So anti-TSLP, it's Teza Pelomab, so that'll be Tezi. Uh, it actually up, uh, targets that upstream tar cytokine, that alarmin. So here, one of my good friends, I can't believe he does this, he created this for us, um, that you can see again at the very top, those airway epithelial cells and TSLPs right there at the top with 25 and 33, interrupting the dendritic cell stimulation and presentation, uh, so reducing the downstream effect and also um, even having potentially effect on the neutrophil side of things. So just as Dupi was exciting because we thought it was upstream, I think this is very exciting. We have our fingers crossed for this. Anyway, anti-TSLP, why might this work? Because TSLP expression is higher in asthma airways. And um, because the TSLP complex increases cytokines in TH2 cells, we think that this might be helpful. And what have we seen so far? Um, it lowers the rates of asthma exacerbation regardless of baseline eosinophil counts or TH2 status. Um, substantial decreases in eos and phenol, so hopefully nitric oxide can be a biomarker. It also influences more than a single downstream pathway. And phase three trials are underway. Fingers crossed this one will come to fruition if it's the right thing. Next slide, please. So you might be wondering, you know, Dr. Katri, it's all very well and good that you have these practice patterns, but where are the guidelines? Well, let me show you. They are, let me just not disappoint you, they're imperfect. Um, so let's go over what EPR4, ERS, ATS, workshop on severe asthma suggests, GINA guidelines, and other sort of people getting together and hashing it out documents. Next slide. So NHLBI EPR4, we were so excited about it coming, really doesn't say much. All it says is refer to ERS ATS. Okay, next slide. ERS ATS though took it ser seriously. What they did is they realized for severe asthma, these were going to be very, very complicated questions. So they asked questions like, what is the recommended eosinophil cutoff to initiate therapy? So they came up with even though low quality evidence that they suggested anti-IL-5 for adult patients with severe uncontrolled asthma with eosinophils that are greater than or equal to 150. Um, they also suggested blood eosinophil cutoffs in um, 
to initiate in, in adults with severe um, exacer exacerbations. Also for kids, they gave some guidelines around that, that perhaps greater than 260 would be good for kids who are greater than 12 years old. And then the other biologic recommendation was that dupilumab as add-on therapy, and for those with severe, severe steroid-dependent asthma, regardless of eosinophils, will do well. So that was actually somewhat helpful because we see, you know, this is endorsed, it's appropriate, it's safe. Um, however, again, they gave the caveat that we should not be just thinking in strict criteria. People are different, and I think monitoring makes a big difference. Next slide, please. The GINA guidelines really go back to the basics because when they say assess the severe asthma phenotype, they say, you know, again, could this patient have type 2 airway inflammation? Look into it further. Also investigate comorbidities and differential diagnoses, as we talked about at the bottom left. And then, of course, you know, some studies have said that about 50% of patients are non-adherent, you know, and they're not trying to purposely be non-adherent. It's just life is tough. It's hard to remember. I'm often non-adherent, but not on purpose. Um, so consi consider adherence tests or using, you know, inhaler reminders. Um, next slide, please. So first they say do non-biologic treatments, do your due diligence, work with them. But then at some point they say finally that, you know, you might have to go to anti-IgE, anti-IL-5 or anti-IL-4 receptor. Which one to start first? Again, they give some guidelines similar to the ones that we talked about before. So that's actually helpful. Of course, that may change. And the good part about GINA is they definitely update more frequently than any other guideline. Next slide. So this is kind of fun. So I get this is it was a drug company sponsored. I don't know whether it was the get together or the write up of the workshop, but at any rate, you know, someone's got to pay for this. Um, but as long as you look at it really from the standpoint of what are the questions that these uh, experts in Europe uh, considered. So <coughs> they had important concerns. And I want to read these to you because these are all important concerns for all of us. How can biomarkers and phenotypes be best identified and used in daily practice? Is the ACQ the right tool? Is treatment response assessed using the ACQ? How can awareness be raised among patients and non-specialists just to get them to care earlier? Are oral steroids effective when people are on biologic? When should patients start and stop taking a biologic? And when should patients be switched? They should have added world peace because these are all very, very difficult to answer. And I see a little question chat box. Um, right, so non-adherence is always an issue. And yes, even cost of medication, we know is a major barrier. So trying to remove those barriers is I think a chronic issue for us, but we have to get creative, yes. Um, so when, where did they come as a consensus? They felt like um, referral to specialists was taking too long in Europe even. Um, and we've seen that too. We're like, where have you been? You're just in the shadow of our clinic. Why haven't you come in? So getting them in earlier. Also, because we are truly, truly seeing the adverse effects of oral steroid use on our bodies, all the chronic conditions, um, thinking perhaps really of reduction of oral corticosteroid use and long-term mobility and using biologics earlier is appropriate, is what they're saying. But they said there's no consensus on length of wait time before deeming someone's not responsive. Um, and maybe switch if you're not able to you know, reduce the oral steroids. But the point is, come up with a plan. Like, what is your goal? Um, and we are so hoping that biologics become disease um, modifiers and then focus on composite phenotype. So in just a little bit, we'll talk about some guidance about how long you keep patients on uh, certain biologics before switching. Next slide, please. I'm just going to give you some pearls of wisdom. You know, this is what we people can do um, when we're giving talks. So practical considers, considerations, regardless of your intervention, is you've got to keep monitoring seeing the patient because what happens is when they feel better, they poof, disappear, you have no idea, and then you see a refill request. You're like, oh yeah, that guy, why isn't he coming by back? Now, also, home administrations. I have to say, I've been a little stingy about it when it came out because I'm like, I'm afraid they're just not going to come in and I won't be able to keep up with them. But it, through the COVID pandemic, has been rather helpful. Uh, 
we try and keep some registries or at least patient lists to be sure that we're keeping track of what they're on and when. And then I would suggest having a real heart to heart, almost like a therapeutic contract. Like, look, you got to keep seeing me because there's no cure for asthma. We need to keep up with it. Maintain your asthma meds and let's come off of it at a mutually shared decision making time. Um, before stopping or reducing your meds, just let us know. You know, you've got my chart, you've got whatever texting. Just let us know so we know. Um, and then provide education and guidelines on stopping prednisone therapy. Um, and now, I mean, as long as we can handle it, leverage virtual care. Because I've been seeing patients from far away or even nearby, and it's good enough. It counts as, as long as you're seeing them. Next slide, please. Um, so basically, I'm thinking that some of, some of these guidelines will help you um, uh, answer the question, particularly how long do you keep patients on the biologics? Do you try and taper off after a certain amount of time? So I'm gonna give you a caveat. There was one patient of mine who was on mepolizumab. Oh, he got so much better. He was so happy. And then he really wanted to try getting off of it. I'm like, look, I just don't think that's gonna work. But he negotiated, I said, okay, let's go to every other month. We did that for a while and he stopped. And within six months, he was bad again. Because really, it's just a blocker. It's not a reducer of the, of the production. So you can have these conversations. I've not recommended tapering off to anybody at all since that time, because I give them that example. <clears throat> and as far as uh, the approach when you want to check peripheral eosinophils on patients on in inhaled steroids, usually even on inhaled steroids, you'll see some bump if they're bad enough that that's the cause of the issue. So just looking for the 150 in the last several months, again, just making sure that you're not checking it close to a time when they had a prednisone burst. And when people are on prednisone, you know, that is actually very tricky. And if they can't come down and we get things in two, two weeks afterwards, um, I sometimes get it anyway, and they're still high. So that's one way. Another way, sputum eosinophils, if people are willing to do that, exhaled nitric oxide. And in extreme cases, I've done a BAL. First of all, anyway, just to rule out why somebody's still sick and see if there's eosinophils in there. Um, so uh, as far as test doses in the clinic, yeah, for now, I'm kind of a conservative doc, like even though some of this is home administration, I just want to make sure that they're okay because there are some side effects that come back later. So I'll get to that in a second, but from an ATS and I'm keeping track of the time, yes, thank you. I'm answering your questions as we go. I hope that's okay. So ATS, ERS, um, expert panel guidelines, switch versus continue. It's an individual decision. You ask maybe why didn't I switch to Dupi earlier from res? Well, and it just looks weird if you're jumping from thing to thing, you're not giving it a chance. So just slowing it down and giving it time, case by case. Again, be clear what's the goal. Is it exacerbations? Is it lung function? Is it steroid use? Beyond FEV1, there's probably other traits we can follow. These are the things that we're investigating. And then often it's the side effect profile that doesn't allow you to continue it. So consensus is generally a minimum of three months. Or you just haven't given enough time before three months. But most often I wait six to 12 months because some of my patients really have taken eight months to get better and then they're on it for years before they see perhaps a waning effect or they just continue to do well. As I mentioned many times, flexibility of criteria because some people with lower eosinophils actually still do fine. Again, you have to monitor them every three months or after a certain level of stability at, at least every six months. Now, would it be nice if we had head-to-head -head comparison trials? We're not gonna get that anytime soon. So we just have to come up with other um, ways to try and assume this. And don't make any assumptions that any one person, that there's only one possibility. So again, it gives you some flexibility. So that's kind of nice. Next slide, please. And so you might, might be wondering, how do you switch when you want to switch? So many of the clinical trials that had people on MEPO, sorry, on omalizumab switched to MEPO, they would wait at least one or two months or 120 days. I don't think they had to wait that long. You don't have to wait for the washout. There's a study here, here for you for your uh, reference to see that, like, just when the next dose is due, just change and switch over. And of course, again, I have them make sure that they come to the clinic for that new one. Next slide. And these are a list of side effects and adverse reactions. You can read them 
on your own. I think that systemic anaphylaxis is a concern for omalizumab. That's why we asked for an EpiPen. For mepolizumab, shingles zoster was an indication. It was hard to get everyone to get a shingles vaccination. They were often $300 out of pocket. We had to sort of ditch that requirement. Um, headaches, 30% for MEPO. That's been an issue. Next slide. For reslizumab, um, there was some evidence of anaphylaxis uh, and we were considering having an EpiPen for them too. But since they're coming into the monitored setting, uh, we're not recommend saying that or mandating that. But usually it happens by the second dose or in the second dose and within 20 minutes after infusion. So as long as they're there, they get the um, uh, infusion and then there's the appropriate waiting period. You have to have good manuals and, of procedures around it. And the benralizumab I mentioned, you know, you're depleting all your eosinophils. Everyone's a little nervous about that. So far, so good. It's only been a few years, but no report of helminthic or uh, infections. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. All right. Case three, problems below the diaphragm. 55-year-old severe asthma, flares every two months, sinus disease with polyps, FEV1 at 58% with 12% bronchodilator response, uh, pheno of 136, venralizumab without improvement. We switched to dupilumab. Next slide. Tolerated the loading dose. Awesome. Second dose with profound abdominal pain. This is your last test question. Go for it. Next. What would you do next? Thank you very much. So right upper quadrant ultrasound, that's appropriate because you don't know what it's from. Blood work is appropriate too and a CT abdomen. I think it, this needs a little bit more investigation before we desensitize because the side effects can be bad. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is below the diaphragm, he said, good to read the package insert. So my colleague who's an allergist also sees him. He got, she got a CT abdomen and there was soft tissue stranding and art artery inflammation, finding suggestive of vasculitis. Uh, we also got eosinophils at that time. He had been down, what qualified him was the 1.24 and then he had been, um, after, you know, been treated. And then now look at this, 4,000 eosinophils. Um, so very scary that that happened. So next slide. It's not common, but there is transient eosinophilia after dupi uh, with inhibition of migration for the circulation to the tissues. And the complications are rare, either eosinophilic pneumonia or EGPA vasculitis. So it might unmask it. Um, also ocular complications. So we had to make sure he didn't have a vasculitis flare. And so what we're doing is we stopped the dupilumab. We're just waiting on biologics until he gets the workup and we see these things get better. Um, and he might be a good mepolizumab at the higher indication, EGPA dosing of 300 milligrams once a month. So stay tuned and be vigilant. Next slide. So uh, basically, um, how will we do head-to-head? -head? Having some core outcomes would be helpful. Just get everybody to be on the same page as what they're looking for. And the last slide is next. Um, just wanted to put out there. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, COVID has come up a lot. I know there's still emerging evidence of what to tell patients with asthma. Perhaps they're not as at risk as we initially thought they were. Uh, and when it comes to biologics, really, um, there, first of all, the latest review said that there's no evidence that they're at greater risk, um, that people who were at risk in a small series in Seattle were the ones who had, had steroids the week before admission. Um, and the general consensus was just the best way to be safe from COVID is to have your asthma well controlled and keep on your medicines, including inhaled steroids and the biologics too. So that's where the home biologics have been very, very helpful. And then in safe places, if they have to come in for residence and that, they just have to come. Um, so that's just some tidbits. I hope this was helpful for you. And then 
Um, the last question I have here, are there any drug-drug interactions you worry about? For example, with a room patient on rituximab or other disease-modifying agents? Yes, uh, I worry about that. There's, again, not much studies about it. So what I usually do is if there's somebody on rituximab, let's say, or for whatever rheumatoid, um, and I, they have eosinophilia too, I will discuss with their rheumatologist, but I will try and stick to the most targeted biologic. So for them, I would use something like mepobuzumab with a good safety profile and just handling the anti-IL-5s, but we're still just figuring it out. So, you know, I feel like we had a good interaction, but I'd love to open it up. If you have any other questions, this is fabulous. I hope some of you are actually here and not just looking at the recording, but I have these other extra slides for you of other indications, but not necessarily for this presentation. So thank you everybody for your wonderful attention and engagement. I hope you enjoyed it. Dr. Mehta, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Have you taken care of all the questions? Yes, I have. Yeah, so all the questions have been answered. So that's great. It's exactly five, uh, four o'clock. So you did it in time. But uh, you have a couple more minutes if anybody wants mm -hmm. to write yeah. a question. Yeah, what would you, what would be your alternative choice for high IG but can't consider omalizumab? Um, is that just, if it's from a side effect thing or they just don't want to try it or for some other indication? You know, if there's any eosinophilia, I might try uh, mepolizumab because those two actually, you know, there's been some head to head studies that when omalizumab is effective, mepo is just as effective, like the one I showed you. That's probably the one I try first. Very good. And I presume that all these patients have been checked for allergies if they have high IgE and they're being treated for, a, you know, um, to prevent allergic reaction or if uh, uh, hyposensitization could be done on these patients if they do not want uh, this particular treatment? Um, so if you're talking about just allergies in general, general as another condition, yes, we, we consider that. I mean, for sure, if someone gets to a point where they're under some control on a biologic and still have allergies as being a trigger, yes, I definitely have. We have a highway between allergy and pulmonary. Very good. And if somebody wants to ask a question, if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to do that. Great. Thank you very much, Shumita. This was very comprehensive, very educational, uh, good references, uh, and people can use the guidelines to choose immunotherapy for their patients. Um, We'll continue to have this FTS, pro, FTS program. Um, next one is Dr. Bart Shelley on July 14th. Um, and I'm sure all of you will enjoy that presentation as well. So if there are no other questions, this will I wanted be to say thank you to everyone for their participation. I hope this has just sort of inspired you to really embrace this condition and, and patients will love you for it. So thank you again for your interest. Feel free to thank reach out so for questions. Thanks, Liz. And thanks participants, uh, without your presence, we cannot do this thing. Thank you, ATS. Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks for revealing yourself. It's the big reveal. <laughs>